Hi, welcome to Rockdown. I'm Wendy Stapleton. Well, to only link this legend with his partner Laurie Allen in the popular duo would be a big mistake. But with a string of huge hits to their name, Bobby and Laurie are still lovingly remembered. With a career spanning 53 years, work in radio, TV, theatre and voiceover work, would you please welcome the one and only Mr Bobby Bright. Hi, Wynne. How are you, darling? Good. It's been a long time. Been a while, yeah, yeah. We should been... see each other more often. I know, we should do this crazy thing. <laughs> yeah. I want to go right back to the beginning. Uh, you were born in Adelaide? No. No, I was born in England. And I left uh, there with my mother when I was about seven. And uh, we came to Adelaide where my grandparents lived. So, um, the singing, did you start at school? When rock and roll hit, I, was, I think I was about nine or ten, you know, and it used to be like half an hour a night on the radio. I remember radio like in Melbourne, or mm. in Melbourne in particular, very, very early on, everything being very sort of British directed, uh, not so much not American. So much. Were you getting American? I oh, know, we were getting Little Richard, Chuck Berry, Elvis. Um, and then it went to like uh, half an hour a night, and, but that was all Sydney DJs like John Laws, Bob Rogers, those guys. And that's where I sort of got into it, you know. So it was Eddie Cochran, it was, was The Ventures, it was The Shadows, it was all. Um, and yeah, my friend and I cr across the road, we used to put on little concerts for our parents and stuff, you know. <laughs> but then <laughs> when I was 13, another uh, schoolmate of mine played men's basketball for his local church team or whatever. And he called around and said, oh, we've got a social on for the end of year, would you like to come, you know? And I, I was 13 at the time. And I said, oh, yeah, OK. Went along. <laughs> Drank for the first time in my life alcohol. <laughs> Some terrible <laughs> yeah. green concoction, you know. Uh, cream de moth, I think it was. It would have been. And um, I found myself singing with the band that was working at that place that night. Now, I don't know whether I was asked or whether I just Jumped up did and it. did it. But the result of that was that I got a telegram saying, oh, you be at the Palais on, on Saturday, there's a talent quest. So I don't, I, I was anonymous. I don't know You're who kidding. said it. No, I don't. And so I went to the Palais and uh, I sang Johnny Be Good. And the judge was Johnny O'Keefe. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he said, I won it. And the next week I was on television. I read, I've got to, I've got to refer to this because I don't mm. want to get it wrong, but I read a lovely article and uh, it was uh, TV star Barry Stanton. Barry Stanton. Now, was that later on? Well, I met Barry through doing Woody's Teen Time, yeah, because Woody's Teen Time was the show in Adelaide. OK, but, so uh, take us through that. So. Well, uh, they used to have a, a major guest star from Sydney each week, you know, and Barry Stanton was one of those guys, and uh, we got on pretty well, yeah. <laughs> What was the show called? Teen, oh, it was Woody's Teen, Teen Time. Time. Yeah. Woody's Teen Time. Because it was a beautiful article and it said that Bobby Bright loves football and cricket. <laughs> and <laughs> I've got, I really, really have to write this down. I loved it. He likes to be extravagant in modern casual clothes. Oh, yes. His favourite pastime is sleep and he just loves fish and chips. <laughs> <laughs> so what's changed? <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that, that's the quaintest, yeah. quaintest review I've ever read. So, so you were really quite young when you were doing all this. I was, yeah, 13, 14. Mm. Formed a band when I was about 15 with Doug Ashdown. You remember Doug? Yes, I we do. We were in America, yeah. yeah. Well, Doug used to work for the, the post office in those days. He played a... Les Paul, one of the first guys, and he had fingers that would sort of hang out right over the bar, you know. And uh, he'd say, well, I don't know if I should uh, leave the post office, you know, it's uh, <laughs> a secure job sort of <laughs> yeah. gig. And, you know, there he goes on to write monster hits and stuff like that. So Doug and I, we had a band called The Bowman, which was uh, pretty adventurous. We used to work well, around Adelaide and up at Elizabeth. And when, when we were at Elizabeth, this young guy used to come up and say, ah, can we do some vocal backing with you guys? Yeah. And he was like two or three years younger than me, I think. That was Glenn Shorrock. Oh, no. And, and those guys were the original Twilights. They were a four-piece yes. vocal harmony band. You know, so were they like, already formed then? Yeah, yeah, as young kids. And they used to come and sing backing with the Bowman and stuff. So you worked in Adelaide with the Bowman. Mm -hmm. Did you actually come over to Melbourne? I came to Melbourne as well as with working them? with the Bowman. Uh, there was a guy called Ivan Damon that used to run dances around Adelaide and he was sort of involved with the television show and the whole deal so he'd been there from the very first talent quest really um, and he, he uh, 
I used to do a few spots around, and also a lot of uh, spots on a, um, a, a radio equivalent of a football show sort of thing. Yeah. After Saturday night after the footy game, the players had come in and a few artists had sing and that. And so I was working in the Damon circuit, sort of. Over there? <clears throat> yeah. And by that time I'd left school. I left school at 15 and uh, got a job in an advertising agency, riding a bike around, <laughs> delivering stuff, you know. But um, then that came to an end through to, due to a credit squeeze where everyone got fired. And I went and worked in an office for about a month and couldn't handle it. And, and at that time Ivan said, oh, look, I'm just starting off some dancers in Melbourne. Are you interested? And coming across, off I went to Melbourne uh, <clears throat> with Ivan. Every Thursday, we'd <laughs> we'd jump into Ivan's big red main line, which was like a station wagon version of a custom line, <laughs> and drive over and drive to Melbourne. Very <laughs> and Ivan would be driving along, scratching his head. Yeah, no worries, father. <laughs> uh, and when I decided to move here, uh, an Adelaide DJ, Bob Francis. Yes, I know gave me uh, a letter of introduction to Stan Rofe. Well, he's a guy who can sing, see what you can do for him sort of thing. And Stan introduced me to Ron Tudor, who was at WNG at the time. And um, I made my first couple of records for WNG. For Ronnie? Yeah. For it was Ron that before Laurie? Yeah. And that was around about the time when the Beatles started, you know. And basically he used to like singing harmony. And so he'd say, do you know so-and-so? He'd name an Everly Brothers. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'll sing it then, and so he, I'd sing. This is so our, he was a Melbourne boy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I'd sing, and he'd sing harmony, and uh, people would say, geez, you guys are good, you know, you should do that, you know. And that sort so of developed, you know. You'd already recorded? I had done a couple of records. So you already had your foot in the door with, yeah. with Ronnie Tudor. Hasn't Ronnie Tudor done a lot for everyone? Hasn't he? Yeah. He's yeah. an amazing man. We'll take a short break, but come back to talking about all of the stuff that you started to do in the studio. Yeah. Uh, and also your obvious, obvious love of uh, the radio voice. Ah, yes. Yes. No worries. Could you take us out from, to this break, please? <laughs> Stand by for a break. Rock down. Welcome back to Rock Down. My very special guest this evening is the gorgeous Mr Bobby Bright. Bobby, we were at this point where I think you just met Laurie. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, well, so we used to do a bit of harmony singing together just for fun. And uh, people said, you guys, you should do that, you know, you're good at it. So we decided that we'd, we'd hire ourselves out. We were both fiercely wanting to be a solo act, you know. <laughs> I want to be an all-round performer. <laughs> um, so we've sort of bit, oh, I don't know about that, but we thought, well, what we'll do is hire ourselves out for two solo spots and then we'll sing a few songs at the end of the night. We did that a couple of times and it worked all right and then... <laughs> then we started getting a little crazy with it all and it was around about the time of Screaming Lord Such. I don't know if you remember Screaming Lord Such. Uh, quite a weird character. Yeah, in very, very weird, yeah. Um, How did I guess that? <laughs> so we, we, we started working with a band called The Undertakers, I think, who Mike Brady, I think, was in the original Undertakers. No. And uh, we'd do stuff like... Uh, uh, the band would play, blah, 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 and then they'd introduce... Laurie had come on and drop it, dressed in top hat and tails and the band had all come on carrying a coffin. They set the coffin down and Laurie would sing a couple of songs and then he'd launch into smoke, smoke, smoke that cigarette. Smoke, smoke, smoke until you smoke yourself to death. You know that song? And, uh, oh, you don't know it? No, it's an old blues song. Anyhow, <laughs> around about that time, the lid of the coffin would move and the hand would come out another hand and I'd push the thing and I'd leap out of the coffin with my hair all teased up and green makeup and a long shroud and, and just monster people. <laughs> so the showbiz bit, that, that started a long time ago. Yeah, a long, a long time, time, time ago. ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had our own coffin, <laughs> which we always had to take in the back way into Laurie's place because his grandmother lived there and she was 98. <laughs> she freaked out if she saw <laughs> that coming. Is this for me? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we did, and we, we did it once at Festival Hall. And they got really upset because I broke a couple of microphones in my thrashing around. I used to go out and lift up girls and take them around. <laughs> All crazy. This is very bizarre act. Oh, totally bizarre. So what were you called then? Uh, Bobby just, and Laurie? Just Bobby and Laurie. And <laughs> those weirdos. And those weirdos. <laughs> yeah. And so they... Um, what did the audience make of this, though? I mean, Who did knows? You, did you, after you'd done all of the mucking around, actually... Oh, we sang a few more songs after some that. Songs yeah, and... yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just... <laughs> 
something different. Just something different. Just a bit of theatre. But anyway, they got so annoyed they wouldn't give us back our coffin. And we had the big gig, like the good Friday, or the Friday the 13th midnight show in Heidelberg. You know, this is the one. (laughs) This is the one that's (laughs) going to break. And we haven't got a coffin, for Christ's sake. What are we going to do? So Ron Blackmore, who was our manager at that time, uh, we drove up and down High Street, Northcote, knocking on funeral parlours. Um, I wonder if you could lend us a coffin. Yeah. Lend and we us, finally cracked it for coffin, one. Yeah. We finally cracked it for one, uh, which was all, the guys. As long as you bring it back tomorrow, you know. Oh yeah, there'll be no worries. But it was like ours was just your bare box. This one was all quilted and lined. You could have lived in it. It was oh, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. So we, anyway, the show went on. Everything was good. So that was the start of Bobby and Laurie, um, and that sort of coincided with, with when um, uh, was his name? Hori Dargi. Yes, the Hori Dargi Quintet. Quintet well, yeah. they're bas- that was basically the impetus and the money behind Go the Go Show and, was it and, really? and Go Records, the whole deal. Because um, he, uh, did Hori Dargi had a show on, did they have a show on telly? I seem to remember them Look, from... Look, he may well have, I don't know. From, well, why, yeah. I know they were quite big in England and, you know, they were known around Europe and all that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, they must have had a spot on telly. Probably, yeah. So were they the producers of the Go Show? No, well, <clears throat> yeah, well, basically they, they put up the money and, and they were the impetus. The actual producer was a guy called Julian Jover okay. who came out from England and his assistant was Dennis Smith who runs Yes, of, yeah. Dennis the agent. That's right. Um, and producer now. Yeah, now producer, yes. Um, so they suggested... Uh, I think Laurie and I were on as, as a solo act each before we actually did a duo on Go. The Go Show just made it happen. Bang, all of a sudden, if you got on a tram, there'd be a riot. <laughs> so by this stage, you, as you said, you were signed up to Ronnie Tudor's label. What was, was that Fable uh, then? W&G. W&G, yeah. Wiggle and Giggle. That's right. Yeah. It's actually White and Gillespie. They, they were actually publishers, book publishers and stuff. So to get, to get on W&G Records, you had to write a song so right. that they had oh, the publisher. Oh, I see, you know? yeah. Mm. You'd already done a couple of solo tracks. Mm. So you already had the contract? Um... I think I was. I think we only signed like one record contract. So you at, weren't at like signed up for a period of years, one at a time, right? just one at a time. But I mean, that was pretty primitive stuff. It was like a mono tape recorder and a stereo tape recorder, and in between there was a blue capstan cigarette tin with a big black knob on the top, <laughs> <laughs> and you'd, you'd put the band track on to the, the the mono recorder, and then play that through to the artist who was going to sing on it, and depending on where you put the black knob, was how much band track you got to how much vocal that went onto the, the, the stereo tape. You know? That was the really and, early And that day. was your mix. Yeah, yeah. before yeah. Bill Armstrong. Oh, and, yeah. And, of course, that all came a little bit later, didn't it? About the 70s. Yeah, the yeah. 70s. Well, that came through around about 64. And that, and that Roger Savage engineer came out from England. He'd been working, I think, at Decker. In I'm England. Like, I'm wrong, but he'd definitely been working as, as the sort of Well, second... Roger was the big, when he came out, he was the big sort of oh. white knight in Shining. Well, he changed the entire... Still is. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. I think he's got a picture in the attic, you know, that never that gets really old because Roger never seems Since to change. change. You know? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he, he had... He knew, like, for instance, Where Don't I Belong With You? It was down at Telefil, which is before... I mean, Bill Armstrong was still involved, but it, they didn't have their own premises yet. So they used to set up in Ackland Street behind a, a big film studio where they kept all the, uh, the flats that you use when you're doing a movie yeah. and they'd just sort of build a square space with sandbags and flats and put the tape recorder outside it and you'd go in there and record. And Roger was all onto a, a stereo recorder, you know. And I said... <clears throat> I remember saying to Roger, like, you know, we're doing I Belong With You, which was our, our first Ooh, hit. hit yeah. uh, can never get enough bottom end on records here, you know. What, how can we get some thump into this thing? And he's going, oh, OK, hang on. And he's gone out and found this giant hunk of wood like a railway sleeper or something, <laughs> put contact mics on either end and said, you want to stomp on that one? <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. And it worked. It jumped off the radio. Everyone went, how did you get that much sound on a radio? That was a huge hit. It was. It was and and it, as I say, it, it changed the way Australians thought about recording. Everyone from Sydney started coming to Melbourne. That's the right. Easy Beats, That's right. Ray Brown, The Whispers, Billy Thorpe, all came to Melbourne. What's happening? Something's happening down there. You know. Because before that, everyone used to go to Sydney. To Sydney, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Well, what we'll do is we'll take a short break there. Okay. And when we come back, let's, let's find out how you actually ended up back in advertising and the beautiful way that that linked up with that gorgeous 
beautiful tone. Oh, all right. Could you take us out? Could you take us out? End of part two. Rock down. Welcome back to Rock Down. Bobby Bright is my special guest, and we were at the stage where you. We were touring with the Rondells. We were touring with the Rondells, and you were telling me that there were two lots of Rondells. Yeah, well, basically, the, the, the touring schedule got too much for the guys in the band. They didn't really want to leave their jobs and stuff like that. So they pulled the plug and said, we don't want... So we were basically needed a band. Mm -hmm. And, again, Ron Blackmore said he knew these guys. Roger Treble, Gary Young, Wayne Duncan, Ed, Ed Bates, I think, was in that band too. Um, and they were just out of school. <laughs> and so they were asked, would you like to be the band? And they said, well, it'd be good, but, but um, Gary's just left the band. Oh, what's he doing? Oh, he's going to form a duo with Izzy Die. Oh, that's interesting. So we thought, mm, that's not going to work. No, it's not going to work. <laughs> so we went out and checked a gig out where Gary was working with Izzy Die, and the whole room buzzed, Bobby and Laurie here, Bobby and Laurie here. You know? So these guys, poor guys, are putting up with you know, the top duo of the time coming to see their band. So we went after, up to Gary afterwards and said, look, mate, um, this isn't going to work. Why don't you come and play drums like with, with Roger and Wayne and stuff? He said, oh, I, I, I've sold my drum kit. And we said, well, that's all right, we'll buy you one. He went, oh, all right then. Yeah. No, I, I did write this down here because I, I, want, I want, please explain. <laughs> yes. That you were well known, Bobby and Laurie were well known for their zany routines and choreography. Ah. Now, I just heard about the zany routine with the coffin and all yeah. that sort of stuff, but I'm a bit well, interested in the chore. Yeah, well, choreography, uh, it was... <laughs> Very little, actually. I was going to say... Know, you'd, you'd get together and walking. say, uh, on the third verse of uh, I Belong With You, when we, we'll all stomp our feet in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, when we get to the end of somewhere, uh, both put our hands in the air. <laughs> You do it with your left hand. On. <laughs> so there'd be like three or four things like that with within half an hour. Exactly. And people would go, ah, oh, they're cor You guys are amazing. Yeah. That's showbiz. And we'd, you know, but stuff, you'd just do stuff, you know, like I might be playing a tambourine and I'd throw it and he'd catch it. Or... But it was very, well, very, well, very energetic stage. It was, stage and Bobby show. and Laurie was much larger than the parts. Yes. You know, yeah. what, what, something happened when we got together. Yeah, it was Not very, only... very exuberant performance. Yeah. Not only did uh, the, the, it sound good, we thought similarly. You know, and it was almost like we had rehearsed, but we hadn't. We just stuff had just happened. And so, how did it all come to an end? Well, we did the television show called Dig We Must, which uh, it was a, it was a twenty four seven thing. You know, like on Monday you'd be doing learning songs for three weeks time on Tuesday you'd be re reviewing last week's show on Wednesday you'd be doing the music uh, at the ABC that you were going to mime two weeks time uh, you know every day was just full of shit but then you went into like radio DJ I went into radio um, what was her name Lily Brett you remember Lily yes, Brett yes I do yeah. she used to edit Ghost Set you know? yeah. she said well, you'd be good on the radio I said, well, how do I go about that? She said, oh, just make a tape, you know, find some ads in the paper, read them out. And... OK, so I did that and she sent me off to 3XY, Dick Hemming, <laughs> you know his son. Scotty. Scotty is Dick's <laughs> is son, it? yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Ah. So Dick Hemming was, was the, the, the program manager at 3XY. I didn't know that. Ah, OK. okay. And um, I b bounced in there with my tape and he sat looking at me. Oh, yes, very good. Mm -hmm. Well, have you ever worked panels? <laughs> it looks like Scotty. Yeah, well, so, oh, they're, they're very similar. They're very similar people. <laughs> yeah, so, so, have you ever, ever worked the panels? No. He said, well, you better learn. You're on at midnight. <laughs> Bang, I was on the radio, you know. That's... So I did that at 3XY. I used to come on after Hal Todd at 10 o'clock and work through till 1. And then I got elevated to uh, drive, you know. I used to do 6 to 9, I think, 6 to 8 or something. Can you please tell everyone now, I know that you've, you've got some projects that you work on and you've got some great gigs that you do in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Who are you working with mainly? I've got a good little three-piece band. Um, Dean Addison plays bass. You know, Robbo plays with Spectre. I do know Robbo. Ro Robbo yeah. plays with me. And um, Rory McKibben, guitar player. If anyone wants to find out where you can see Bobby playing, 
you can look up um, our website, which is www.rockdown.com. Is that correct? Uh, so if you want to find out anything at all, anything at all about Bobby... It'll all be there. It'll all be there. So uh, I want to thank you so much for coming on tonight. Uh, it's wonderful to see you again. And as I said, we had, uh, we had a lot of fun in the 80s. And, um, <laughs> they were good days. Yeah. So many things that you've done that people wouldn't, wouldn't realise, but you're a very, very, very talented man. And um, Thank you. all the best for all your gigs. And um, do you just keep doing rocking on? Stuff. You keep rocking on. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. See you next week. My mama plays me for a fool. That woman took me for a fool. I've seen the child and his eyes are blue. Mine are brown and yours are too My mama plays me For a fool I mean she took me for a fool My mama took me For a fool Why does she play me For a fool He slew footed his neck is long He was nuts when you got him home My mama plays me For a fool I mean she took me for a fool Why does she take me She plays me for a fool His tongue is blue and his hair's red Some fella been in my bed Some fella been in my bed Judge, I said, been in my bed Judge said, sit down, don't complain Pay her the money, I'll explain If you don't, if you won't You go right to jail, I mean the county jail Take me for a fool His speech is studding His lips are flappy His breath is bad And his head's nappy I'm one of plays me For a fool I mean she took me for a fool Why does she play me For a fool Yeah, she took me For a fool His back is bent He won't live long His eyes cross His side's gone She took me for a boom My mama plays me for a boom Why does she take me for a boom? He's messed up, he's out of whack He's not my child, you take